This is a talk on verifiably having no head. Stay with me on this because what you're about to hear is something important. There's a reason you want to know that you don't really have a head. Indeed, this seems like an utterly ridiculous claim, a kind of childish entertainment. Of course, I have a head. We know confirmably that many people around us have the unfortunate fate of having to look at their heads frequently in reflections all over the place. Yet, once had, this realization is at once undeniably profound and strangely ordinary. It is tied up with mindfulness practices, but it is not that as such. That is not even really necessarily required for a glimpse of the fact that you do not have a head. And yet it is undeniably a strange realization and a profound realization. And what got me there was a book by a gentleman named D.E. Harding. Indeed, there must be something about the Himalaya. The rarefied air there seems to trigger something in man. It did in me. It has in many others. It reminds me of the story of the British Raj's incursion into Tibet in 1904. Commander of the British India Force, Sir Francis Younghusband, later the president of the British Geographical Society, whom, once he began departing the country after some warfare, was overcome and by all accounts sat flabbergasted in the mountains, infused with a love of the whole world, and that men at heart are divine. Something very similar happened to E.R. Harding. At the age of 33, while walking through the Himalaya, was overcome with the simplest and at once one of the most profound of revelations. And that is that he, in fact, did not have a head. And the simple realization was very much verifiable. And once he had caught a glimpse of it, there wasn't any real way of going back and unseeing it, because it was in fact actually seeing. For my own part, this was all part of a cascade of meditational realizations that I had in alarmingly rapid succession a little while ago, which seemed to run in to everything that I had always been doing wrong. One of my mentors, whom was monumental in this unwinding, told me that it amazes him how many cushion sitters, referring to meditators, are completely missing the point. And I had to nod my head in knowing agreement. Well, apparently nodding my head. People in the West sit a lot. Everyone sits for hours, sometimes in extreme pain. This is okay. This is something I do as well. I love to sit there in extreme pain. And yet, in a certain way, there's little or no discussion about the very experience itself other than whimsical discussions of doctrines or tying together various abstract concepts. So the subtleties of profound perceptual shift tend to go missing. We sit there for hours and hours on end and seem to be completely missing the essential realizations that otherwise come about fairly easily once someone simply points it out to you in a way that doesn't rely on some abstract mystical nonsense. One of these profound shifts for me is realizing that I also did not in fact have a head. Now, this subtle shift in seeing the world has implications. And one of these implications is questioning the very nature of selfdom and what it is. But that will be maybe a discussion for another time in another video. As Mr. Harding describes in his book, which incomprehensibly to me has three and a half stars as a rating on Goodreads, implying that it is an average read to most people, showing at once the maddening imbecility of the species, and that everyone actually appears to be looking at something, or everything everywhere other than where it actually is. Nevertheless, in Harding's case, he told us, Somehow or other, I had vaguely thought of myself as inhabiting this house, which is my body, 
and looking out through its two little round windows at the world. Now I find it isn't like that at all. As I gaze into the distance, what is there at this moment to tell me how many eyes I have here? Two or three or hundreds or none? In fact, only one window appears on this side of my facade, and that one is wide open and frameless and immense with nobody looking out of it. The key to this seems to be that it, whatever that is, is not there as distinct from here. Many have mistaken this for some sort of objective physical claim in the sense that if I cut my head off, I would not die. Rather, this is a kind of elegant instruction manual for an empirical glimpse of seeing the lack of what is actually there compared to what you've always thought is there. The point is that I, whatever I is, is not even actually there. And it can actually be very simply seen. What follows is an exercise often promoted by his students. Try to turn consciousness in on itself for a moment. And I recommend if you're operating a car or machinery, perhaps you don't try this part, just in case you're a fast learner. Take a moment to look at your hand. You appear to be able to see it with all its sensations and apparent outlines. Perhaps take a look at your feet and maybe look at some other people if they're proximate. Maybe you can even go and look at them straight in the face. And if they ask what you're doing, just say, I'm looking for my head. Grab a small mirror and maybe look at your reflection if you have one available. Now, for a moment, we want to try and turn around from looking out there to looking at what is looking out there. So take a moment to point at your head. Now, ask yourself, can you see what is looking out when you look back? Even when you look at the reflection in the mirror, you may be seeing a head, but you're not seeing the reflection immediately. You're seeing a reflection in the mirror that apparently is in front of you, reflected in your consciousness. So what did you see? You are now looking inwards, turning the direction of your attention around 180 degrees from the objects out there to you, the subject. Did you see your face? Did you see anything there at all? Rather, could we now say everything seems to be spontaneously arising in the same pure void or awareness in which everything else appears to be spontaneously arising? What is out there, even, when you think about it? Maybe at this point you've gotten a glimpse of what is meant from these instructions. If you do, then you've seen exactly what Harding meant. And it is pretty amazing at first how truly surface the apparent lack of self really is. This is something that old texts and masters and religions made seem so utterly inaccessible, usually telling us that insight comes from depth of understanding. Perhaps language games or abstractions, ways to understand what is in this way. But what we've noticed here is that it, it is in fact right there on the surface all the time. In Buddhism and other empirical type practices and religions, it is easy to ignore the ultimate simplicity of practice. That instead of simplicity, everyone is expecting supernatural thunderbolts to flash from their eyes and out of their asses and physical energy fires to burn up their egos and kundalini energy rushing up their endocrine system before their you know physical form evaporates into the ether 
Hey, that might happen, but it seems unlikely to me. Sitting in meditation for eight hours a day for the rest of your life just seems essentially painful. Interestingly, it has actually given me a totally new perspective on sitting, quite literally. The perspective is that in some way, there's nothing to be gained. And because of this, it has become a kind of pleasant experience. Whereas before, I always felt as if I was waiting for something to happen. Like Harding, once you glimpse something on the surface that is apparently so difficult to see that you've been unable to notice it almost forever, what there appears to be is pure luminous void. A luminous void that is something that simply is. And it is not here as distinct from there. His words are worth contemplating. Now, I realize as much as anyone else that topics like this run the risk of sounding like a bunch of commie gobbledygook. But rest assured, this contemplation is worth your time, and if you didn't see from the exercise I prescribed, I suggest you look online for various exercises, or even if you want to contact me, I'm happy to go through it with you. So, I hope you enjoy the next few weeks, perhaps months for some of you, looking for your heads.